Welcome to the Road to Kyoto podcast from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. I'm Ian Tennant. The Road to Kyoto is a series of discussions with some of the leading experts who study and track organised crime and related policy challenges. We're speaking ahead of the UN Crime Congress, which takes place every five years. The Congress is an opportunity for the international community to come together to make progress on countering organised crime and the damage it does around the world. This year's Congress was scheduled to take place in April in Kyoto, Japan, but has been postponed due to the coronavirus. It's not yet clear when the Congress will take place. Today we will be discussing cybercrime with Neil Walsh, the Chief of the Cybercrime, Anti-Money Laundering and Countering the Financing of Terrorism section at the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. So I'd like to welcome Neil today and as an opening question ask him when the international community talks about cybercrime, what do we mean and what is the UNODC's role in addressing it? Thank you, Ian, and good morning. Nice to have you sitting in my office in the delightful Vienna International Centre. It's good that you've started with the easy and quick questions. So what is being discussed politically and what's our role in it? It's a really complex question and the answers almost evolve on a day-by-day basis. There are currently four cyber political processes in the UN, two on cyber security, two on cyber crime. The two on cyber security are based in New York. UNODC, we are part of the General Secretariat, we're part of New York, but we tend to be much more of the Vienna Consensus. We don't do the voting bit here, that tends to happen in the General Assembly. And the two cyber security processes have come out of the General Assembly through resolutions that states agree on. And one came from a resolution that was penned by Russia, one penned by a resolution penned by the US. The Russia penned resolution ended up with a event called the Open Ended Working Group on Cybersecurity. It started uh, back in September of 2019 and it's due to run through to the summer of this year, 2020. And it's looking at nation state behaviour, how states interact with each other in cyberspace, how they mitigate and manage risk. And then the other process, which is running in parallel, is called the Group of Governmental Experts, the GGE. It has existed since 2004. And the open-ended working group is open to all member states. It is only open to civil society organisations that have ECASOC accreditation, which has somewhat limited the participation of civil society in that. But the OEWG is open to all member states, whereas the GGE is limited to 25. And those 25 states are selected by the Secretary General, taking into account Security Council, taking into account geographic representation, etc., etc. And the GGE is looking principally at norms in cyberspace. The GGE back in 2015 agreed by consensus and issued a report to the Secretary General on 11 non-binding voluntary norms states can uh, prescribe to and try to implement. And all of this is about countries trying to mitigate and manage risk against each other. Like everything in diplomacy, it's kind of uh, how I describe it to my staff. I like surprises at birthdays and Christmas and ideally at no other time in that. And that's the essence of diplomacy, not having surprises, mitigating risk, understanding each other's position and trying to deal with that. So that's what the GGE and in many ways the OEWG are all uh, discussing in parallel. They're both New York-based processes. Correct. They're New York-based process. I represent us at the Open Ended Working Group, but I don't go into the GGE because that is limited by the the number of attendees at it. The next process is a a process that's existed at UNODC in Vienna since started off in 2011, then operationalized in 2013. That's a word I can rarely say, so I'm quite impressed that I got away with it there. And it's called the Cybercrime Intergovernmental Expert Group. And the role of the IEG, there was a cybercrime study done by member states and written up by UNODC way back in 2013. And this intergovernmental expert group is governments, sometimes private sector and other actors coming together to really look through this study, albeit that it's getting somewhat dated now, but looking through that study, the recommendations that it makes and working through a five-year work plan. We're at year four of this five-year work plan now, and the next meeting with this intergovernmental expert group is due to be 6th, 7th, 8th of April this year, where they'll be discussing international cooperation, how states counter cybercrime through international cooperation. That could be judicial cooperation, prosecutorial cooperation, law enforcement, all of these bits coming together. And we have the expertise on this. We're really actually, I'd love to say, we're 
quite good at it. We know what we're talking about. We understand the policy. We understand the politics, which are often rather tricky. We understand the capabilities of member states. And that's why through the Vienna spirit, through the consensus-based operations here, we can actually start to achieve things. We can start to get things done. And we can draw out the nuance of these consensus items that bring countries together rather than pushing them further apart. And the last and complementary in many ways uh, process that's kicking off this year is a cybercrime convention process which is based in New York, but UNODC is the secretariat for it. So we're just really starting to feel our way through this and to see how it's going to work. Again, this was a resolution at the General Assembly penned by Russia last year and passed in December. And it goes towards creating a UN convention on cybercrime and I guess looking at what the rules and law and legislation will be within that. But we're still at a very early stage in that, so I don't have an enormous amount of information. There'll be a meeting in New York in August where the states will decide how we're going to manage this and how to actually operationalise, negotiate and discuss this convention. But really early days on that still. Okay, let's talk about the politics a little bit. We know that the issues being discussed around cyberspace, cybercrime are quite politically contentious, which is why there's a number of different processes going on. And there are different understandings of issues like freedom of expression, human rights, territorial sovereignty in cyberspace. Mm -hmm. So what opportunities do you think the Congress coming up in April and the related Crime Commission, which takes place every year in Vienna, represent for achieving some more consensus on on some of these issues related to cybercrime? That's a great question. And Like all of this, it's really quite tricky to answer. But it seems to me that sometimes if we focus on the politics, we focus on the bits that divide us rather than what brings us together. And the way that I tend to discuss this is we have to look at, I look at you, I look at your colleagues, I look at people that I walk past in the street. What do you expect of us? What are we trying to do here? Are we trying to find the areas of division? Are we actually trying to do something that makes a difference in people's lives? And I think that has to be the driving force behind us. We have the sustainable development agenda through to 2030 and the cyber elements, you know, often UNODC talks about SDG 16, which is the crime judicial justice side of things. I look at it more broadly than this because we've all got a phone, one, two, three laptops, tablets, all of these things. These things are our conscience. They know everything about us. They're in our pockets 24 hours a day, seven days a week beside the bedroom table. It geolocates you. The phone microphone might be operating without your knowledge. Sit on a packed underground train or in an airport and shout, OK, Google, and you'll hear bing, 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 bing. So you've got these devices that are collecting everything and knowing lots of things about us. And they're critical in countering cybercrime and they're critical in enabling human rights, privacy, freedoms of speech. And they can also be risk against that as well. So I think what we need to be doing in the cybercrime space is not getting too caught in the politics. There are regional splits. We know that and we know what those are. We know how they play out. They play out in New York the same way they play out in Vienna. So it would seem to me that if we want to try and do something together on risks that are transnational, that impact on every country, then we ought to be looking at what those risks are and how we do something about it. So for example, when my staff deliver capacity building to police, prosecutors, judges, we often focus on countering online child sexual abuse. It is an enormous threat. And when I talk about that, I mean talking about, we see, for example, there is the routine rape and sexual violation of pre-verbal infants and children through live streaming abuse networks by pay-per-view videos, paid for with Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, where children are horrendously damaged and even risking death. And this happens on a large scale day in, day out, around the world. You then take that further, that a recent analysis done by the UK-based Internet Watch Foundation, which is an NGO that takes down child abuse material from the internet, they're seeing that 50% of child abuse material, so we're talking under 18s, 50% is now self-generated. So what I mean, I mean children taking naked selfies and taking naked sexualized imagery, sometimes consensual, sometimes not. There's enormous risks in that. There are risks of our children being criminalised. There are risks societally, socially, mental health, all around this stuff. And this impacts on countries around the world. This doesn't care about politics. So that's what we ought to focus on. Do you think the international community is doing enough? On those, I mean, you've mentioned some particularly horrendous and prevalent crimes. Is the international community doing enough? And you know, what more can be done through these international forums? So is the international community doing enough? No. 
and they could do more and they should do more and governments ought to hold each other to account for doing more. Uh, society, the normal, nice, everyday people who are listening to this have to hold people to account for doing more about this. This impacts on all of us and things like the Crime Commission and the Congress create that opportunity with a multi-stakeholder approach, like having people like you in the room that don't get to go into intergovernmental processes because this is broader than government would be my sense of things. And just to be entirely clear, this is my personal view, not the organisation's view. But this is broader than government. Government doesn't have the solution to all of this. If it did, we wouldn't be in this space. We see technology evolving at a pace that policy, politics, legislation can't keep up with. So we need to talk about what's really happening in real life. And that's where when we speak to victims, when we speak to police officers, when we speak to healthcare operators, judicial operators, when we speak to NGOs, to charities operating this space, then you start to understand the threat. And when you understand the threat, you can start to look at the right policy response, the right legislative response. If you're not speaking to reality, then you're missing what's going on around you. And I think what people listening to this, what I hope they hold us to account for, is actually doing something that counts, that still pervades human rights, privacy, freedoms of speech, which are fundamental to everything that we do, but still help to manage the risk and manage the threat. Um, and do you have the political or the policy space to do some of those practical things or does the political situation hold you back? I don't think the political situation holds us back because the advantage of the UN is that we ought to be able to talk to everyone and what I'm really proud of my staff is that the show where we do talk to everyone we can speak to countries around the world with the sort of honesty that we're having now and that's what again diplomacy is fundamentally about transparency. That doesn't mean telling everybody everything, but I can sit and have a conversation with you the same way that I could have a conversation with a government in the West, in the East, the North or the South. So the politics will exist, national positioning will exist, intranational positions will change, sometimes on a daily basis. We see some really challenging positions in the debates of what states can do on each other through military, through intelligence, through law enforcement. We see really challenging debates on encryption, on freedom of expression, on public policy. But yeah, we can talk to that. My challenge is my bit of the business is entirely 100% extra budgetary funded. I'm running out of money. I've had to let staff go this year rather than increasing what we do. We have governments asking day in, day out for our assistance, and I literally have no money to put into that. We've got some, but we're barely functional. And that's because we rely, we have a frankly fractured funding model that stops us being able to respond to the needs of government. That doesn't feel to me to be right. I'd like to go back to something that we've touched on, which which is the Vienna spirits. By this, you mean the lack of voting and the need to uh, agree things by consensus here in the policy areas like the Crime Congress, the Crime Commission. Now that the resolutions, there's some new resolutions that have been passed by the UN General Assembly in New York on these issues have been passed, does this bypass the policy debate here? Does it supersede it? And do you think that the debates here would become obsolete because of them? No, <laughs> is the quick way to answer that. No, it doesn't bypass. No, it doesn't make it obsolete. Does it potentially make it more challenging? Logistically, yeah, it can do. But no, I think if we simply see a resolution or the operationalization of that moving from one geographic location to another and saying that the other side isn't relevant anymore, I think we missed the point. The expertise is here. The expertise has been here for years and will continue to be here. We understand the politics in New York can sometimes be more, as you say, voting based, so it is more divisional potentially because you're voting. And this is what I like about Vienna. You know, I've only I've been here five, start of year five now. I think I'm starting to understand it. And that consensus is what it's about, that we can sit down with countries from around the world who we know of different policy positions and they will state those. But from that, we'll start to identify those consensus areas. Now, that makes it challenging sometimes. And, and you know, you've been there, you used to work in government, so you know how difficult that can be. You could start off with a glass of water in your hand and by the end of a consensus negotiation, you're not sure what it is anymore. But you do reach consensus. I think that's what it's about and that's what the public expect of us. There is no one size fits all to this is how it feels to me and trying to apply a one size fits all can be exceptionally challenging. We have to be cognizant of national sovereignty, of national legislation and how that plays out. And our role in this, it would seem to me, is to offer advice, to offer some challenge sometimes and to offer some guidance on how we can do things, how we can get things done that actually make the world a safer and a better place. I think we have to make sure that the expertise that exists continues to exist, continues to offer relevance and 
to offer advice. If we simply get stuck in regional, national, international politics, I'm not sure what that will seek to achieve. And that's why there are these four processes, but there are other multi-stakeholder processes in the UN, like the Secretary General's high-level panel and digital cooperation, capacity building that can run along the side of this. So if we continue to speak to truth, if we continue to speak to th real, what is the threat, how do we seek to address that, then we'll be okay. You've described a very complex policy environment and the challenges you face and the challenges we all face to tackle this are clearly great. But when you get to the, the Congress, what will your message to the international community be? Work together, understand the threat, understand that politics are tricky, recognise that, be cognisant of it, but don't let it frustrate you, don't let it get in the way. It's not what the public expect of you. If you stop people in the street in your capital city and say, hey, we were really good today, we stopped something from keeping people safe, is that what people expect? If you actually speak to the threat that is in everybody's home, in everybody's life, then you start to look at what do the public expect of us. We are international civil servants, we are diplomats, we are NGO staff. What are we trying to do? Are we trying to make the world a safer and a better place from the risk that is out there from criminality? I think the answer to that has to be yes. And if we bog ourselves down in politics and take pleasure in frustrating each other, I'm not sure that that achieves the aim that we're seeking to get to. So the point of the Congress is getting people together, speak to expertise, speak to people who have experienced this, work out the policy solutions, work out the legislative solutions, work out the capacity building solutions. Time and time again in New York and in Vienna, the consensus area that comes up is capacity building. So if my message to government, capacity building you say is important, then invest in it. Don't have us struggling for funds, trying to achieve something on a shoestring. Invest in us. Sustainable strategic funding of three or five year budgets that mean that I'm not recruiting staff who then spend three months looking for a new job. Have us focus, have us work together, have us ensure that we can do something that makes a difference. That's your job to do as much as it is mine. And when we get things like the Congress or the Crime Commission, that's where we can bring people together to discuss these issues, shine a light on it. And the work that you guys do in this space has never been more important. Neil Walsh, that was a very clear message. Um, thank you very much for speaking to the Global Initiative today and um, see you at the Congress. My pleasure. Thanks, Ian. Please subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen take a moment to leave us a review. They help us get noticed and improve the show. For more on organised crime, head over to our website, www.globalinitiative.net. You can also follow us across social media by searching for The Global Initiative. This show was produced by Jack Megan Vickers with help from Paulina Russell-Barris. I'm Ian Tennant. Thanks for listening.